Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Arthur Stewart. Um, I'll be chairing this meeting this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many people logged in. And particularly, I gather that a lot of people were here for the first part of this talk a few weeks back. So we're very privileged to have a, a stellar lineup this evening. Uh, we've got Mr. Arthur Cummins, who's a medical director of the Wellington Eye Clinic in Dublin, and he focused primarily on premium cataract surgery and refractive surgery. Uh, we've got Rafiq Girgis, who is a consultant ophthalmologist based in Bristol, and his focus is primarily cataract surgery. And Sandeep Ketapal, who is a cataract and refractive surgeon based in Windsor, where he is the director of the Windsor Eye Clinic. So I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of an introduction about the EMV lens. Um, sorry, this is rep repetition for those that were logged into the original conversation a few weeks back, but I think it's important for us to just go through the, the, the properties of the lens before we start. So I hope I can share my screen here and we can get going with that. Essentially, the EMV lens is marketed as an extended depth of field lens and Rainer's idea is for it to be used as part of monovision or monovision enhanced as they describe it. So monovision is so sort of the test of time really it's been used with contact lenses by opticians it's been used with monofocal lenses and cataract surgery for years and years but it's got some well-known drawbacks patients suffer with intermediate vision loss because one eye is covering distance one eye is covering near and there's a gap in the middle that they fall in between so computer vision distance can be quite tricky they also struggle with tolerance because the two eyes are separate there can be a lack of summation between the two and there's good evidence to say that the tolerance rates is only around about 65% for monovision over 1.25 diopters. For the same reasons, the patients then have a loss of distance vision because their reading eye is blurry and it's taking away from the distance vision when they're using two eyes. And as we discussed earlier, there is summation loss. But also there can be stereoacuity loss. And in some patients, if you break that stereoacuity for long enough, it's actually non-recoverable. So we all owe all of this to Graham Barrett's incredible work with Monovision over the years. And he has designed the EMV lens in conjunction with Rayner. And essentially what the EMV lens does is it induces positive spherical aberration. So what that does, it increases depth of field by essentially creating a circle of least confusion. So instead of having one sharp foci that you'd have with a standard monofocal, you get this circle of least confusion where the eye can take what would be a normally blurry image and transform that into a sharper image. Not only that, but when patients are reading, their pupil is constricted. And then there's also central neural processing. So you can take a quite significantly blurry image from a reading eye, seeing at distance, much better than it would do with standard monovision. So that means that instead of patients having one eye completely separate for distance, one eye completely separate for near, there's a little bit of give in each eye. So the distance reading of the near eye is better than it would be with standard monovision and the reading vision of the distance eye is better. So that means that there's summation between the two eyes and patients get better tolerance and it overcomes the vast majority of the limitations that we spoke about earlier. So I think we'll start this evening by talking through what each of the panelists think of the lens in terms of their, 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 their experience so far, why they use the lens, what brought them to it to begin with. So if I could turn to Arthur first to talk us through his experience with the lens, that would be great. I'll mute myself. Thanks, Alistair. Um, yeah, I started using the lens about a month ago and I've done 24 lenses in um, 11 patients have been bilateral and two patients have had it just in the one eye. And I use monovision a lot. I've probably done about 12,000 monovision cases, all the way to minus two in the second eye, and I've been doing it for, for 27 years with, with very good success. But as you mentioned earlier, people have this gap in the middle. Some adjust pretty well and others don't, and there are ways of assessing that before the time. So this lens sort of made intuitive sense that you could, you know, you could bridge that gap without having the dysphotopsy of a, of a diffractive lens. Um, but when I started, I was asked to sort of look at what it looks like going for emetropia in both eyes. And I like that idea because I, I could see how that compares to a monofocal lens or, or other lenses. And I've been very, very impressed. It's a super lens. Every patient's really like the result. They seem to like the clarity a lot. I like the, the way the lens behaves. And I have most people having a lot more near than I 
I'd expect, even from an, an, a Monovision Plus. So I almost get the idea, I haven't really used Monovision Plus lenses, um, but I get the idea from what I've read that this could be called at least a Monovision Plus Plus. It seems to give more than a Monovision Plus lens. So I've been very impressed so far. And as I now started using it on my own terms, I think I'd use it a lot more in the Monovision sense. And I'd probably go with um, planar on the one eye, minus one, minus one and a quarter quite readily on the second eye. And I think that might give you a very nice range of vision. And what are you doing, Arthur, in terms of counseling these patients? I think we spoke a little bit last time about whether we tell patients that this is a different lens. Do you, do you talk them through that? No, I'd heard enough from you and from others who started using it that said this lens behaves just like a monofocal from a distance point of view. So there's there only an upside. So they weren't charged any differently. They were just given a lens um, asking for distance vision. And they've all been really pleased by what they've got um, for intermediate and some have even got near. I mean, there's one patient who's got the full range of vision from the EMB lens and both eyes are in emetropia, they're not offset. So, um, so putting them in, putting the lens in as a monofocal, I'm impressed with their monofocal outcomes for distance. They've got a high quality of vision, no one complaining of dysphotopsia, but on top of that, they've got this, this increased range of vision. So, so far, really happy, but I don't have much experience with blended with this lens. How many cases do you feel you'd need to do, Arthur, before you consider doing the blended? What's your? Oh my goodness, I would have started doing it much earlier, but I was asked to first just get a sense of what it does sure. with eyes at emetropia. Okay. So I use blended vision a lot, even to this day. I probably use blended vision, uh, maybe the same, you know, to the same extent as, as I do ATIOLs, um, EDOFs, or trifocals. Brilliant. Thank you. Can I come to Rafiq for, for your experience with the lens? Um, I have similar experience for like Arthur. So I am using the dominant emetropia, aiming for emetropia in the dominant one. And I go around minus 0 0.2, minus 0 0.3 in the non-dominant eye. And I'm really, really impressed with uh, distance vision because I feel most of my patients like to have like nearly 20, 20 vision. Um, so my view about this lens is it just, it gives you very distance, very good distance vision. Plus, you know, I would say extended depth vision. So I tell, I counsel the patient, I tell them it's not a premium lenses um, because I'm not considering it yet as a premium lenses, uh, but it gives you like a sort of, um, able to read at the distance of your arm, maybe closer. And the results are amazing. Like I have patient who could see uh, N6 unaided. Um, most of my patients see like aiming to, to these figures, you know, like emetropia in the dominant eye and minus 0 0.2, minus 0 0.3. They can see N8, the range between N8 and N10. Um, amazingly, also, it just it is applicable for patients who you can't put trifocal, like um, dry type AMD, um, stable glaucoma, and uh, patients are really really happy, and uh, they tell me, well, just uh, the first time to be able to see without glasses, and read without glasses. Their distance vision usually around six nine. I'm not saying it is six six plus, but six nine due to other comorbidities, which is understandable, of course. Um, so overall, I am, I'm, I'm really happy uh, so far. Um, I haven't gone more blended than, you know, like minus half or minus one so far, because I like to take it very slowly and see. Um, I have done around 30, 40, uh, cases, but just I, I am very keen to do the second eye quickly, uh, like um, two weeks after. I don't wait for five, six weeks unless I have to. Um, and the reason for that, I feel both eyes work together in much better way than one eye. Um, also, I noticed the results are better in younger patients. So younger patients usually see easily. Um, 
reading is is very easy for them to see even n8 or n6 you know um so this is overall so i i feel it's 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 very promising um you can use it when the trifocal and other premium lenses are unapplicable yet i am looking forward very much for the toric version of this lens because this will help us a lot because by correcting the stigmatism will create like more depths of vision. Um, so patients will be easy to, to read well, um, rather than correcting on, on, only the sphere. Um, so I, come I came across few patients like minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.75. Um, so I would be much happier when the toric version of this lens comes in the market, I think. Samir, are you using this lens for patients that have got visually significant cataract or are you using it as well for patients with refractive lens exchange? Um, I use for both. Okay. I use for both. But okay. patients with clear lens extraction, I am more careful. I just tell them it will give you clear vision for distance. However, you will need glasses for reading, definitely. Okay. Yeah. And I don't do them for like patients 40 or 50 i i prefer to like above 55 um, and another thing just I, if they were younger uh yeah but there right. is this another thing just i would like to mention i i found it very useful when the angle kappa is high and you can't use trifocal um I was very skeptical when I started, of course, but just what encouraged me is the surface of the lens is like monofocal. So it is at the end of the day, it's a monofocal lens. Um, and I, I don't know, for some reason, I think the design of the lens is helping. If you have like a little bit bigger angle cava, it may help to get them a little bit of more depth of vision. Um, might be related to the, the different spherical abrasion between the central part of the lens and the edge of the lens. I'm not expert in optics, you know, uh, but from my understanding, the lens, I, I, I had this feeling. The other thing I wonder about that, and I, I've been trying to get more information about the spherical aberration properties of these lenses, and Rainer were reasonably tight-lipped about it, which is fair enough, um, but the 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 there will definitely be a differential in the amount of spherical aberration induced across the power scale of the lens. Mm. So, so different powered lenses will induce different amounts. And I wonder if the bigger angle cappers, generally speaking, will be the higher amotropes and whether that may impact on it too. That'd be interesting to know, but this is all things that's down the pipeline. I, I, we're very much in the early days of EMV. We don't have all the answers. That's important that the, the attendees know that, that whilst we'll try our best to answer all the questions, it's still early days with this lens, it's in development. Um, Rena have asked me to explain that the, the Toric is in the pipeline. There isn't an exact date yet, but it is It is on the way. Rafik, are you using any other similar lenses like that do are Toric? I know there's a, a Tetanus available with similar sort of properties. Uh, well, just I, I'm not, like I'm a bit skeptical to use like trifocal toric, especially in high refractive errors. And uh, so just I I use I like to use um, like monofocal toric or trifocal. Sure. Uh, combining both, just I I feel you have to be very very careful. Um, but I think the re one EMV is a unique in the market, which is really really motivating me to use you know uh no i haven't used other thickness or in other okay. ones no. sure. mm. sunday can i come to you for your experience and how you got involved with the mv good evening thank you and uh, good evening everyone yes um so thank you very much for asking me to participate i'm not um a previous rainer unit user apart from the odd custom lens and sulcaflex here and there so it's been quite an interesting journey and um I think that the track of these lenses is really along any of the enhanced monofocal lenses, whether it's back to the accommodative lenses back 10, 12, 15 years ago with the Human Optics 1CU, which I did quite a lot of, and the Crystal Lens, the Crystal Lens AO. And then there's been a bit of a gap 
uh, until recently. Now we have a cluster of them come out, including the, the Rainer EMV. Um, the reason why I decided to try this platform is because I think when you're starting any new lens, I like to start with a platform. Key number one is that the, the you should be confident about your biometry and the A constants. And therefore, if you're starting with the, the Rainer lens, which is an established lens platform, as other companies are doing on their platforms as well, but I'm comfortable with the A constants for these lenses that they haven't changed. There was an experience with the previous lens I had where the A constants were modified after six months, all the calculations were out for the first six months. So I think if you're starting new, even if you're not a previous Rainer user, it's nice to know that the platform is stable, your biometry will be reliable. And of course we have very good peer support. Normally we'd be go to conferences over the last couple of years, but we haven't been anywhere very far for the last 18 months and discuss with your colleagues and friends what you, what they think of the outcome. So this is all, it's all very useful. So uh, on the basis that I tried another company's lens for the past 18 months, I was not impressed uh, with the outcomes uh, so far. I decided to try the, uh, the Rainer lens and I've been very, very pleased. Um, my approach has been a, a little bit different in that as a cautious use starting user and having seen some loss of best correct acuity, apparently in some of the other lenses that I've used in the past, I started them all with non-dominant eyes. So a lot of blended vision. And once you're happy with the biometry, obviously we all do our, our dominant eye for, for Plano or minus 0.25, whatever you think you're going to get around Plano. And for the non-dominant eye, I have just as Arthur has done before, routinely tried to push it a little bit less than minus 0.4, 0.5 if patients will tolerate that. So gradually with these lenses, I started with that. I've done under 20 patients, but I started with that and I've pushed them out to minus 0.6, minus 0.75, minus 0.8, 0.9. I've not gone to the minus one in any patients that are the non-dominant uh, blended eyes as Rainer suggested yet. But the interesting thing that I've been impressed with is that patients are tolerating that level of induced blended vision better than they're doing with previous monofocals. I, I do tell them, that they're going to get distance blur in that eye and they have to not compare the two eyes, but they're not complaining of the, the overlap or the distance blur as much as you would expect. So that's a very pleasing tolerance. And their intermediate vision is very good. Mm. Um, and a few that have got closer reading vision at minus 0.75. Uh, and the question that's posed previously is what happens to distance vision? That's a bit variable, my numbers are too, too low. So I think if people are starting, I think that's a good way to start, gets you confident and the patients are are happy. It's not, um, as Rafiq says, it's not an alternative to um, vision correction pathways totally. I mean, if you have younger patients who want vision correction, you know, you, you still would start with the premise that they might do with a, you know, a need offer a trifocal lens and counsel them accordingly. I had a, a colleague in, in my hospital who said, this is great, these lenses are great. Uh, he was using another company's platform. You don't have to counsel the patients. Uh, you know, it's not an excuse for, for lack of chair time. So if you're going along vision correction, you're going along vision correction, I should counsel them accordingly. So I've done one group as um, blended and the second group I've done um, about half of them as myopes. And that's also a good way to start. I think Rafiq was telling me earlier that he, he starts with patients with a little bit of pathology so you get confidence in the lenses. Um, and I did that with the previous enhanced monofocal that I used. Um, and on these ones, they work well with myopes. They love them. And I know myopes are generally happy anyway if you reduce their prescription, but these patients, um, come out with, I would call it super satisfied. There's some, I haven't used the Corona monofocal, so I don't know about the clarity and the contrast of the standard monofocal lenses, which I, I presume is good, but they come out with a really, very happy expression um, uh, of, of myopia, uh, whether you tried mono, uh, monovision or otherwise. And uh, I've done three now patients um, with uh, what I would call indoor monovision at minus one, minus two, and these are ecstatic patients. They have a very good, indoor vision, just wearing glasses or driving and uh, going outdoors. So those are two, two ways to start, really. If you're a monovision patient, Sandu, do you do a monovision trial for them? Always, or? always, yeah. Always, if, 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 if they've not done it naturally or not done it before, I, I will not do monovision unless they've tried it before. But I, I find that with the blended vision up to minus 0.75, minus 8, 1.8, I say minus 1, I haven't done as blended. I don't think you need to do a monovision trial for those because they tolerate that degree of discrepancy, mm. amotropia they do. But yeah, no, always. I wouldn't do it without without trying. And how do you do a monovision trial? Do you do contact lenses? That's difficult, isn't it? If, they're, if they've got relatively good vision, you can do it with contact lenses. When they've got the cataracts, of course, mm -hmm. you can't. And then I, I just don't do it. Um, and, I, and I think for these lenses, um, 
the question of wh which patients you put them in and you can debate whether you put in the patient with advanced cataracts you've got an elderly patient with you know an only eye 90 years old with you know 660 vision whether you'd benefit in that lens probably not uh, and similarly at the other end of the spectrum you know you've got a 55 60 year old who really wants total spectral independence you have to start with your your premise of trifocals i think so i think these are mild to moderate cataracts younger sort of your know, 50 to 75 patients i think they would do do very well and i think uh, mm. a monovision trial if you can do it is a good idea but not not for a little bit of blended you don't need it for that i don't think so yeah a formal monovision but the question is if you take the rainer recommendation of plano and minus one whether you'd need a monovision trial for that um i don't know what arthur's view or your view would be on that so i've been doing all of mine as monovision uh, minus 1.25 or minus 150 and that's off the back of, um, of of doing a lot with the fair experience of presbyond so at our clinic that's our that's our go-to correction for presbyopic patients and so if patients come with cataract where we can't just laser them straight off the bat what we generally look to do is is either do their cataracts with a monovision uh, sorry a monofocal and then do presbyond afterwards where we'll we'll aim for around about a plus one refraction and then do laser blender vision afterwards or if the patients then are perturbed by the time that it takes to do that, because you've got to have two cataracts, usually I'll do them two weeks apart, and then wait minimum of eight weeks to make sure the refraction is stable and they haven't got any PCO before we'll do the laser, and plus the cost, because it, it, it does become quite expensive, then I'll offer patients the MV then, and I've basically been using it to try and replicate the effects of Presbyond. And my numbers are low. I'm only just getting into double digits of patients, but my tolerance has been great. I've had no complaints whatsoever. Um, I've been looking at the, the distance vision of the reading eye and the reading vision of the distance eye, and it's been incredible. I mean, the standard reading for, for, for the Plano eye has been about N8, a few more than that. And the standard distance vision of the reading eye generally is around about 2063. Now, if you're targeting minus 150 with a monofocal, they'll be 2080, 2100 easily. Uh, and that, that, that is how this works, right? If you've got better distance vision in your reading eye and better reading vision in your distance eye, you're gonna get better tolerance for this. So in early days, but I'm, I'm very impressed with this lens. I'm trying to do a little bit of work with working out what the spherical collaboration component is, so measuring them before and after. And that I think is an interesting, do, you, do, you, do any of you feel that there is a need to be looking at what the patient's corneal and ocular spherical collaboration is before you put these lenses in? Is it a consideration? Alistair, we recently had a, a, on one of the forums, big discussions about spherical aberration. And I would normally look at corneal spherical aberration and try and make the decision on which lens to use based on that. But the, yeah. the, the major consensus on the forum was people didn't think it made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. They didn't really think it made such a big difference. What I like about this lens, I have put this lens in a couple of patients who had previous LASIK. And the lens behaved beautifully. So I don't know exactly what the spherical aberration in the lens is and what the design is, as you say, but it just seems to be tolerated as well as a monofocal. And that's, that's a very, very good place to start. So you've got this wider application, you can use it. And then on top of that, you get this additional reading or intermediate rather, and, and often reading too. Have we got any questions at this point while we have a little think? Victor, I don't know if there's anything in the, in the panel there. There are a couple. Yeah, can I ask uh, Alistair, just have you used it in patients uh, previously had LASIK for myopia or for hyperopia? Do you I have haven't, any? I haven't. haven't. My, my feeling mm. behind that is that most of the time when I've got patients that have had laser refractive surgery before, they'll have a reasonable amount of spherical aberration induced on their cornea by mm. virtue of having that laser. So most of the time, I wanted to keep that there for them. So basically return them to where they were after the original Presbyon. So most of the time I'm using Rayner's Ray 1, which is spherical collaboration neutral. Occasionally, if I, if I want, if, if, it, if it's dropped slightly or it's, it's higher than I'd like and I want to influence the spherical collaboration, I'm using lenses where I've got a definitive, know exactly what the spherical collaboration does. And so things like lenses like the CT Spheris by Carl Zeiss, which I know has a spherical collaboration induction of about plus 0.4, uh, 1.4, Whereas I just don't know with the with the MV yet, so I would certainly consider it because I, I think it will do well. But until I know more about 
exactly what's happening with the show collaboration. I'm going to hold back on that. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the first question we have is, what influence does pupil diameter photo mesopic have on the aisle performance? Anyone like to take that? I can just, in our brief experience, it's 22 eyes now, we have not seen an issue. So it seems to be, I see it from Tiago. Hi, Tiago. Um, it seems to be less of a, what can I think of it? You, you know, the monofocal plus is, you think of a little bump in the center. And this seems to be less of that. It seems to be much more of a blended approach. So it seems as though the asphericity seems to be not just in the central optic, but maybe slightly broader. So we haven't seen problems at all. People have been very, very happy with the quality of vision day or night. And I, I, think, I think that will make sense, Arthur, because I think this lens isn't going to be inducing huge amounts of spherical collaboration. So whilst everyone's levels will go up as their pupil size increases, I don't think this is going to be into sort of the, the toxic levels of spherical collaboration that, that one would worry about. Uh, uh, this, sorry, can I just add that? Ahead, in, I think, no, I just agree in, in a small number of patients that... Um, we've seen we've not had any issues about visual quality and it's been you know, apart from looking for any undue degree of sill to start with mm. uh, we i've put them in all sorts of corneas so um apart from previous lasers um so i i think they're tolerating it very well across the spectrum and i think the design of the lens with a diffuse average across the front should 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 uh, you know not be have an influence from pupil diameter i don't think so and Sundip, I know we're in a, a rain of talk, so feel free to decline this question. But have you had any experience with the eye hands? Because uh, uh, you've a lot more experience with these lenses than I have the, the MV. And um, that for me, if I was thinking, if I've got a patient that I want to use a toric MV, but I can't, that is an option. Yeah, yeah. I put I put in some eye hands torics, um, and that I put in about five or six. And I haven't. The problem is I haven't seen that. I put them in patients who've got high sills, I put them in high myopes, and I put them in more, more complex eyes. So I, I haven't seen any particular anecdotal benefit uh, in intermediate or uh, closer vision with those lenses, but I don't think it's a, it's a comparable group. Um, it's a bit early days, but that, I use that because those were, were available, yeah. And Tiago's second question is, how can a previous hyperopic ablation on the cornea influence the IOL optics performance? I don't like to take that. So, Tiago, the previous patient who had refractive surgery was a myope, so he had some negative surrect aberration, and I was very happy to use this lens, and it worked very well. In a hyper as Alistair said, I'd like to know a little bit more about how much surrect aberration is in the lens, because if you land up adding positive surrect aberration to the corneal positive surrect aberration, you could get to a toxic level. So I'm not sure, but I, I think it's quite gentle. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it gets all this power. I'm really keen to see what the optics of this lens are because based on the design, it's so friendly in terms of dysphotopsia. So you sort of figure that it doesn't have much in terms of, of depth of focus, yet it gives you way more depth of focus than I'd expect from a, a, a monofocal plus. I mean, it's almost in the range of a EDOF. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting lens, very interesting lens. You can... It's one of those lenses you can start using safely without too many concerns about explaining dysphotopsia. Mm. And then the next question is, do you suggest using wang cock adjustments for longer eyes? Yeah, uh, the answer to the question is um, yes, or the holiday adjustment. You must get the best bar which you can in, in all eyes, absolutely. Across the board normally, yeah. yeah. Um, for, for those of us in the panel with NHS, um, patients do you think that this lens has got a role there do you think it would be a good lens then it's just to use just so that you know aim emetropia as you do normally and then patients get the benefit of some reading do you think that's got some legs might be but um, it is more expensive than um, the normal monofocal lenses um, i had a discussion with uh, rena rib about that you know just um, i don't think I doubt very much the NHS will be able to fund something like that because it's about um, 150, between 150 to 190. So most of the range of the lenses are around 50 pounds. So just there will be like triple the cost. Mm. Um, so for financial reason, I, I doubt this would happen. 
you know, Alastair, if someone would do a, a really well-conducted actuarial study and look to see for patients who've got monofocals in and are wearing very focals and see how many times they fall and break the hips and get head injuries and then see if they had a lens like this in where they still had reading glasses, but they carry them in their pocket because for most things, they're pretty functional. Yeah. And I find it's quite cost effective to actually use a lens like this. But I hear what Rafiq says, it's tricky. Um, I don't think in, this, in the state system, you can actually ask a patient to co-pay. Is that right? You can't no, ask them to you do can't, that. You can't we, we don't have the, No, we don't have this system here. This is American system, so uh, yeah. yeah. Oh. yeah. So I think just returning to the, the, the discussion about whether we should measure spherical collaboration prior to these patients, I, I think would, would the consensus be that certainly if they've had laser refractive surgery before, but perhaps not if they've virgin eyes? That would be my feeling. No, I, I would agree with that. So, yeah. yeah, I totally agree with that. I'm, I have been very skeptical to use it for uh, patients who had LASIK before. Mm. I suppose only one for the, same, for the same reason, you know, I, I can't measure the spherical collaboration. You know? It would be really difficult. Okay. Um, are there any other questions that anyone wants to ask from the audience? I think I've answered the one. We've answered the ones that are in the Q and A. Alessia, there's another question on the BNL EDOC lens. I don't have any experience, but someone else might have. Just any Sorry, feedback or experience with the BNL EDOC lens? I don't either, Arthur. Sunday, Rafiq, do you have any experience? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't used it yet. No. No, my 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 go to EDOF has been the uh, the Zeiss Lara lens, but um, which I've used for a long time with very good outcomes. So uh, that's the question. I think um, whether you do blended. I've done blended vision with monofocal and and EDOF lens in the second eye quite a lot. Um, and the question mm -hmm. is whether this will match that. And so far, it seems to be very reasonable. Are myopic eyes possibly a better option than high myopes? I'm not sure I understand the question, Sean. I mean, I mean, the question in very high myopes is whether they've got any myopic thinning or degenerations in there. Mm. So, I mean, when you're getting to very high levels of myopia, are they going to appreciate any enhanced range? And that's very difficult to, to answer. So, yeah, um, yeah I certainly, uh, the ones that I've done so far are... Um, you know, minus one to minus six, probably so far. But I don't think it would necessarily be anything detrimental for them, would no. there? I mean, you, you, you're right to say that the benefits of this lens probably would be um, reduced by if they've got reduced best corrected vision and things like that. But no, I don't think it's necessarily contraindication either. Um, is anyone in a position to compare the non toric eye hands and the EMV lens? Well, it sounds like <laughs> Sundeep is again. I'm sorry. I can. Um, <laughs> this is being recorded. Um, I'm just. <laughs> So, um, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big J&J Technus user, and um, so I think the iHance is a very good lens, uh, and I think it's um, got a lot of promise. Um, uh, I find the EMV lens very good, diplomatic if I say that, uh, and I'm using that as my current first choice. Uh, the difficulty, of course, as with Rafiq, my first set of iHance lenses, I'd chosen patients um, which I felt had a little bit of compromised ocular pathology, so the, the BCVAs were not quite as good, so that I can't directly compare it. Um, but I think you have to try it in your hands with your biometry and your experience. And certainly if you're a J&J &J user and you're happy with the biometry and the way the lens handles, um, you know, there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't try that first and see what your own outcomes are until there is direct comparative series. Sean has just uh, amended his question slightly. What he meant was, are myopic eyes possibly a better option than hyperopic eyes? Um, I can't think of necessarily a reason why that would be the case. I'd be happy to use it in either. Yeah, I, I agree. I use. I have been using in both. There is no. Yeah, I will be skeptical if the patient had LASIK correction before. Sure. You know, but for virgin myopic or hyperopic, uh, it wouldn't make huge difference. Alistair, I haven't I haven't looked at that carefully enough yet because I've done hyperopes and myopes. I should look at that maybe and see if there's a correlation. Yeah. Because okay. as you treat a hyperope. The higher the hyperopia, the higher the power of the lens you're inserting. You're putting in a 24 or a 28. And when you put more power in, you do tend to get more impact from on near. And if you have this extra spherical aberration, you might get more reading than you would in a lens of 10 to after power 
that you're putting in for a high mile. So that might have been um, where, where the question's coming from. Uh, yes, I see your point. Yeah, well, the, we, we may well get an extra benefit then in that in that situation because yeah, the yes, the, just because the lens is more powerful across the range. But my impression has been that everyone has got more reading than, than what or more near, I should say, than what we anticipated, and and some have got the full range. I mean, for lens for lens like this, they've got the full range of vision. I'm sure that person was a high pro, but I need to go and check that. And can I ask the panel individually, how, how has it changed your practice? Is it yet to do that? Is there anything that you, you're not doing now that you're now doing because you're doing using the EMV or is it still in the early days where you're, it's finding its way into your practice? I mean, from my point of view, I'm using it for nearly six months, not many lenses, but I'm finding that I am talking most patients who are not suitable for multifocals, talking about thinking about putting it in the non-dominant eye to start with. Um, I've now done three patients in the dominant eye. And as Arthur and Rafiq are saying, they haven't lost any BCV and you've been saying as well. So I'm now more confident to do bilateral. So I'm now listing some patients for both eyes if they, if they want to do that. Um, so I think it's, it's an enhanced intermediate lens. I think it's uh, got a lot of promise. Um, and I, I, I'm currently changing my practice to think about it actively for at least one eye in, in my standard cataract patients. Yeah, I agree with I agree yeah, with this approach. I I am gradually just converting from monofocal to EMV, uh, but very slowly, uh, cautiously, and um, I think it will be much more when the toric version of this lens uh, comes up in the market. Yeah, I would agree. From my perspective, is I'm asking the question for, for the sake of, in Ireland, the difference between a monofocal and this lens is about 70, 80 euro. And patients are allowed to co-pay in the, in the private system. Right. And I'm thinking, I'm almost doing a disservice to someone putting in a monofocal where you could put in lens that's just as good in terms of distance, but gives you a better range. So I think I'm gonna use it more in that scenario. And then one place I'm gonna definitely use it more and I'll start doing it now, because we still do a lot of blended vision and, and monovision. And I'm thinking with monovision, where you have a lens that has a fixed range and it's quite a small range, there's always a gap somewhere. If you go zero minus one, the reading's a gap. If you go zero minus 175 or minus two, intermediate's a gap. And I think with this lens, in terms of blended vision, you can do more like you do with, with Presby on Alistair, where you get more of a, a blend between the two. So I think it's going to work very well in that scenario. And it sounds like, Sandeep, you've had a lot of success with exactly that. I mean, your patients, are you going minus one, minus two, have no complaints. They're not complaining about the difference between the two. They've got a really good blend between the two eyes. Do you know what sort of distance vision they get out of that the the, the lower myopic eye? Somebody? Yeah, they're getting about six nine six twelve. So it's a little bit better than you would expect. It's yeah. not six eighteen. So, um, and but it's very low numbers. So I think the impression so far is if you're uh, a little bit myopic, the distance vision is probably, I mean, Rainer is saying this, but anecdotally, it's the numbers are small. I've got some patients who haven't improved in their, their BCBA distance vision. So, you know, they're not better um, in, their, in their blended minus 075i. But I think that it's like Arthur is saying, I think it's better than you would expect by some degree. And although, you, of course, you get some monofocal patients who do, do get reading vision, they do get and it vision on occasion, uh, the number that you're getting with better near vision uh, anecdotally is more than you would expect. So this overall is giving a better range, both for distance and for near than you would, you would expect from a standard monofocal. When, when Sean Mockett came into to theater with me the first time he used the lens, he shared an idea that I think is very, very nice. And what he was saying is that a couple of people is looking at putting the EMV in the dominant eye and targeting close enough to amyotropia. So almost expecting pretty good distance, well not expecting distance for sure, and very good intermediate too. And then in the non-dominant eye, putting in a trifocal. So now you get this very good range of vision. You tend not to get the dysphotopsia because it's on the non-dominant eye. And I think that's quite a neat idea. I'd love to hear what they think of, you know, how that, that study is panning out, but it's, it's quite an interesting idea. And Milan Pandey, um, as for a long time been using trifocals just in the one eye, in the non-dominant eye. And he's found that work very well over the years. It's not something I've done. I've always put them in both eyes. We have another I, have, I, have done, I have done few um, a trifocal in one eye and monofocal, but not EMV in the other eye. And it works very well. 
Similarly, I've done a lot of I've done a lot of monofocal and EDOFs in the second eye, and also uh, trifocal in the non-dominant and bi bifocal or EDOFs in the dominant eye to try and reduce dysautopsia. It's anecdotally, it seems to work mm. work well. So it'd be interesting to see that combination. Mm. Uh, the next question, question about the, go ahead Alison. is with the fact that the technology shows a slightly myopic post-op autorefraction is it best to aim for the nearest minus or should one consider something just slightly on the plus side particularly for the plane no eye anyone wants to take that yeah, it's a really good yeah, question can... it's a very good question and, and it's it's one of those where because it's got this nice range you can be slightly less accurate in your biometry and still have a good landing zone. Yeah. But the moment you start using that as a, as a buffer, you start losing the effect of the lens. So ideally, you want to get it on target for distance and whatever you get from it, um, the positive, the positive uh, spherical aberration, you know, use that to your benefit. Yeah, so I'm trying I to get think, as close to play now as possible. Yeah, but Sandeep has found with minus one seeing 612, I'd be very inclined to aim for the first, the first minus target. What do you think, Sandeep and Rafiq? And yeah, you, I think I, I, I agree with you. I aim for emetropia. Yeah. I mean, I mean, emetropia mean, first minus or first plus, plus of plus point one two or minus point one two. Uh, plus. Plus. I always aim for the first minus. <laughs> I started with minus. I started with minus, but I found just um, the distance vision is not perfect as they wanted. So I, I diverted a little bit to towards the plus side, but not to use plus because I, I hate to aim for plus. But in these lenses, I have to a little bit. Yeah, I think it depends how much plus is and how much minus. The minus 0 0.1 exactly, yeah. 2, but, but you're right. If you start aiming with minus 0 0.3, minus 0 0.4 in the dominant eye, you're, you're risking your, in the younger patients, they're not going to like. Yeah, this does be, yeah. Mm. So it, yeah, it depends where you're like, what do you mean by the first minus really? But yes, I think we are um, uh, all agreed. Uh, the, the question is whether you would go with auto refraction, really. Uh, I, I don't really go for auto refractions. I think if you're going to see patients and change your um, planning and your, your biometry, you need to go for proper um, you know, subjective refraction results. I never rely on the auto refractor at all. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. So we're through all of the questions. Do any of the panelists have anything else they want to raise or any ideas? I think the comment I'd close with is that when new lenses come to the market is you're always apprehensive. You want to be careful about things before you try them out. And you know, like we're like, oh, we've done over here. But I think of all new lenses that have come to the market, this has been the easiest one to, to start using because it behaves very, very much like a monofocal, except you get this additional bump. So yeah, don't be afraid to use it. No, I would agree. I think uh, be confident. My philosophy until this point has always been to wait for six months until my friends and colleagues have used the lens and told me that it's fine to do so. <laughs> and so now we have that degree of experience and you have this panel and previous panels which who are saying that it's a very good lens. I think that it's, uh, it's not inferior to monofocal, so feel confident, you know, put it in your amotropic eyes, try it out. Um, and, you know, I think it's, uh, very tolerant of aberrations. I haven't done uh, LASIK eyes before, uh, but I think that it's uh, likely to benefit your patients um, positively. Yeah, I, I, just, I agree with that, you know, just selectively start with your patients, you know, like uh, not highly demanding and uh, safe eyes to do uh, technically as well. Um, but the, the, the lens is, is very, very promising and just I, I, I like it so far so good. Yeah, I, I would completely agree. I think in, in some elements, if you're using a monofocal and aiming for planar, you've almost nothing to lose. I, I, I like the yeah. way that Arthur yeah. incorporated into, into his practice to begin with of, of just trying the emotropes and seeing what happens and the benefits of it. If you, oh, I always believe that if you, if you, um, promise little and deliver a lot it serves you very very well and if, if you're managing to get patients a bit of surprise reading then that's superb but I would then say that taking it a step further I, I found really great results with with the monovision I, I, I would encourage people to again start start small but but move on into that because I've I, I really believe that it's it's a great option for patients so um 
thank you very much to everyone who's been listening to us today. Um, so if you want more information about the, the Ray One, then Rayna have a lot, so the EMV, Rayna have a lot of resources available. Uh, their website is here. Obviously all their representatives are keen to talk to you and you can arrange a trial very easily. We'd also like to mention that we have a, a talk around the table discussion with a great panel at the Escris, which is a live um, presentation coming out. Um, I'll be part of that and it would be great to see as many people log in as possible. Thanks so much for your time. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.